Good morning. Please take a songbook and turn to number 141. 141. We'll begin with this song this morning before our scripture reading and prayer. Let's all sing out together. Verses 1, 2, and 4, more about Jesus. Let's sing together. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show. Psalms chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. Psalms chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in the in his holy place, he that, <clears throat> he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Dear God, our Father in heaven, forgive us when we fail thee so that you may hear our prayer. We're so thankful for the night's rest, for the many blessings of life that allows us to be here and study with those of like precious faith this morning. May those that have prepared lessons have done so adequately so that they may be equipped to break unto us the bread of life and may it fall on good and honest hearts. Continue to watch over and forgive us when we fail thee, for this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. We welcome you this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're grateful for your presence for our Bible study period. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we want you to know that you're our honored guest. We're thankful that you're here and invite you back anytime you can be with us. We'll dismiss now with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. <clears throat> Middle school, high school, and adult classes dismissed.
Okay, we're in 2 Peter chapter 1, our studies in this class. <clears throat> Basic concept that we're looking at in this letter is that of growth. <clears throat> Twice, once in 1 Peter, once in 2 Peter, Peter encourages brethren to grow. First Peter chapter 2, he said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And then in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that is the <clears throat> concept that we have before us, is that of growth. And it seems that Second Peter is especially addressing that issue. When we look at the first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1, as we have already noted, Peter has mentioned the fact that God has done His part. He has <clears throat> provided the proper atmosphere in which growth can take place. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything that we need is provided for us. We have those assuring promises that when we have done God's will, when we have grown sufficiently, then God will give us that ultimate reward of a home in heaven with Him. <clears throat> and so with all of that said, he comes down to verse 5 and says, And beside this, <clears throat> in the American Standard Version, as we've already noted, <clears throat> Yea, for this very cause, for the cause of being partakers of divine nature. And that's what we ought to be striving for. That's the goal in this growth process, to be of divine nature rather than of earthly nature. And in order to do that, <clears throat> there are some things that we must have as a part of our character or our life. And those are the things that we are currently looking at that are listed in verses 5 and following. Beside this are for this very cause, in order to be partakers of divine nature. What is the first thing that we must exercise? <clears throat> diligence. Diligence. Giving all diligence. And we noted the importance of that as stated in various other sections of the Bible. And God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 6. <clears throat> and so if we want to be blessed of God, then we must be diligent in our service to God, in our efforts to grow and develop and mature into that divine nature. And when we have done that, then that divine nature will be ours and we'll be the recipients of those great and precious promises that he mentions in verse 4. What is the foundation <clears throat> upon which all else is to be built? Faith. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Faith is the foundation. Faith is produced by a study of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 and 17. And so as we read and study and become to an understanding of the Word of God, faith comes out of that or grows out of that. And that's the basis upon which everything else is built. We are justified by faith. Romans chapter 5 and other passages that we noted in the text when we were uh, studying that uh, last week. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, We walk by faith, not by sight. And we emphasize that walking by faith, walking in the light, uh, 1 John 1, 7, following the Word of God, <clears throat> all are different ways of saying the very same thing. And so we add to our faith. That's the foundation. Add to your faith virtue. What is that? <clears throat> what? 
All right, that's uh, basically we define virtue as moral courage. The courage to do what is morally right in spite of all of the persecutions, trials, tribulations that these brethren were facing that we may face in our lives. We have the courage, knowing what God wants us to do, to do what is right. And, of course, the world in which we live can hardly be classified as morally right. As a matter of fact, when you read and hear some of the things that are taking place in our society, it is unreal how far we have gone from the morality that is revealed in God's Word. What are we as Christians going to do? Are we going to have the moral courage to stand for that which we believe? Or are we going to be weak or indifferent toward the principles that are set forth in God's Word? <clears throat> Some of you may be on the uh, email list or mailing list of Brother Jim Waldron's uh, newsletter. And uh, the latest one that I received, at least, that was one of the things that he was uh, talking about. Uh, professors from colleges who are uh, losing their jobs because of their moral stands, because of their uh, courage to state in class what they believe. Ironically, some of it had to do with Catholicism. When they were teaching classes on Catholicism, simply stating what Catholicism teaches. And yet the college or the institution had uh, the audacity to relieve, and some of them are being reinstated as a result of intervention of lawyers and so forth, <clears throat> but it just simply shows us how far from this book our nation as a whole has gone. And as it goes further and further away from this book, the more and more you and I are going to be affected on our daily lives or in our daily lives. What are you going to do? Are you going to be ashamed of what you believe? Are you going to cease practicing what you believe? Or are you going to continue to believe and teach and practice what you really believe from God's Word in spite of what might happen to you in regard to that? So we think of this idea as moral courage. Well, it, you know, we, we have had the idea through the years that it really doesn't take a lot of courage to believe what God's Word says and teach what God's Word says and live what God's Word says, but we need to be aware of the fact that we are already reaching a point in our society. And I don't think, uh, and I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that things are going to continue to get worse. What are you and I going to do? Are we going to have the moral courage to stand where we need to stand? We may have to go back and remind ourselves of men like Daniel, who in spite of the circumstances he faced, placed his faith in God and did what was morally right. We may have to <clears throat> think of young men like Joseph, in spite of what he faced, had the courage to stand where he believed God wanted him to stand, or people like Esther, and on and on and on the list may go, where we as God's people have to go back and do a real in-depth study of these characters and try to put ourselves in their shoes and be able to stand for God like they stood for God. And so we knew we're, we're past the point where we can just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know, we don't. We're not really concerned about that in our society. We better be concerned about it because it's happening around us. And so add to your faith courage. If you have faith in God and faith in God's will and a desire to be in heaven with God, and that's the goal that these people are, are striving for, First Peter chapter 1, that inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved in heaven, ready to be revealed. We've already studied that. But if that's our goal, if that's our aim in life, and we believe in God and His will 
Now, our obedience to that in order to get to that inheritance, then it's going to take some courage on our part to follow through with that, isn't it? And so we as God's people need to kind of re-examine what we believe and <clears throat> where we stand and think seriously about the statement that we've already covered in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, and, and we looked at it in its context. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh. And we've often pulled that out of its context and basically had that saying, anytime anybody asks you a Bible question, then you need to have an answer for them. That's so far from what Peter had in mind. What he had in mind in the context was when, when you are being faced with death, <clears throat> And perhaps uh, uh, some uh, Roman soldier would say to those brethren, why are you willing to die? For what, what is it that you believe? Why are you willing to die for what you believe? You can give them an answer. And so we may face those similar circumstances in our own lifetime. And we need to have the courage to stand where we believe we need to stand. So while Peter's writing the brethren several hundred years ago, it still can be very, very applicable to us. <clears throat> I think that's why a study of the uh, book of Revelation is, is becoming more and more timely in our society because that book was basically written to encourage those brethren in Asia Minor as a result of the severe persecutions that they were facing Revelation 2 and verse 10 sums it up. You be faithful even if it costs you your life. And I'll give you a crown of life. And the rest of the book is kind of based on that. But within that book, John writes at the insistence of our Lord <clears throat> that what they were facing was not going to, to last forever. There would come a time when the Roman government would not persecute the church as it was at that point. So you just try to be faithful. You endure to the point when you'll not be facing that anymore. If you cost your life in the process, you'll be with God in heaven. But within that book, he also emphasizes that there will come a time when there will be a similar situation to what they were facing. And when and where that will take place, I don't know. You and I may face it in this country. And if we are, how pertinent the book of Revelation would be to us in that regard. Understanding our faith in God and the courage to stand where we know we need to stand. Add to your faith virtue, moral courage. Add to your add to virtue knowledge. <clears throat> knowledge of what? What God wants you to do. Keep on studying. When do we learn it all? We don't. It doesn't matter how much you study, you'll never learn it all. There's always room for growth in that area, add to faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance. What's another phrase or word for temperance? Self-control. And of course, in the context, uh, the circumstances of life do not determine or decide for us how we're going to live our lives. You've probably heard the expression, we don't hear it much anymore, Situation ethics. That was a philosophy that rose its ugly head a number of years ago, which basically said whatever the circumstance demands, you do it, that's right. That's what determines right or wrong. Whatever the circumstance demands of you at that point. If it demands that you lie to get yourself out of trouble, then situation ethics would say that's okay to lie. If you're in a crowd where the consumption of alcoholic beverage is the thing taking place. In order for you to, to find acceptance in that crowd, situation ethics kicks in. That's all right. Let the circumstances decide what's right or wrong for you under those circumstances. We need to go back and <clears throat> think about what our Lord said to Peter. Remember when we started looking at this, and we'll continue at the next hour, but in Matthew 16, Upon this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth, King James says, shall be bound in heaven. Literally, shall have been bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall have been loosed in heaven. 
from the original language. The truth is already bound in heaven. Circumstances of life do not decide what is right or wrong for you or me. What is right for you is right for me. What is wrong for you is wrong for me. What is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. And it matters not the circumstances under which you and I may be faced at the time. Circumstances don't determine that. We have to be able, though, under those circumstances and whatever those circumstances may be, we must have the strength and the courage and the faith to keep ourselves under control. Is that always easy? Absolutely not. <clears throat> it's not always easy. But if we're going to continue to grow and develop as a child of God, then that is expected of us. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, to temperance patience. That's what we've labeled in the outline as faith's abiding Patience in the Word of God suggests what? Huh? Long suffering. <clears throat> the ability to endure. You might think of the word endurance in connection with the word patience, and, and you think how uh, accurately that applies to, to these brethren, whatever the circumstances. You're able to endure what comes your way. In James chapter 5, James said, You've heard of the patience of Job. You want to talk about endurance? Go back and study the life of Job. What do we have to endure compared to what Job had to endure? We don't, for the most part. Now, that is not to minimize what you and I have to endure in our life. And what you endure in your life may be more or less what I have to endure in life. But what you have to endure, what I have to endure in life, whatever it is, how great or small it is, is, is difficult for us. We have to endure it. And I don't intend to minimize anything but simply suggest when we look back at Job, how was Job able to endure? Because of his faith in God. Where does this all begin? Add to your faith. That's where it all begins. And so we build on that faith, the, the ability to withstand whatever comes our way. And as we noted, it's only a natural follow-up to self-control because only those who discipline themselves or, or control themselves are going to be able to endure whatever comes. So you can almost see how these things build one upon the other. It's not like we can accomplish one of these things and then just kind of forget it and move on to the next one, accomplish that, forget it, move. No. They're, they build together the kind of character that will result in that divine nature. They all work together. These things that he's listing in this section are not independent of each other. Remember the idea that, that uh, Brother Wood suggested that we noted in the introduction to this section, how these things are literally placed together to present a beautiful chorus they work harmoniously together to present a very beautiful character, that divine nature. That's what we're striving for. And so you can see how each of them is tied to the other in that regard. Then add to your patience godliness. This is what we've labeled in the outline as faith's acceptance. What is godliness anyway? God-likeness. Well, does that kind of sound like divine nature to you? If we are like God, then we will have a divine nature. Godward attitude. Attitude of what is it that God wants me to do in my life. Um, 
one of the the, the summer series at uh, at Rockmart. That's that's their basic theme for this summer is is godliness or Godward attitude in various areas, and it's certainly a worthwhile study. Uh, so what is what if I if I'm living a godly life? then what is my attitude going to be toward different things? Well, if I know what God's attitude toward it is, then I can know what my attitude had better be in that regard, whatever the subject might be. And so it's characterized by Godward attitude. Does that which is pleasing to God. In Romans chapter 12, Paul encouraged the brethren to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what godliness really is. What is acceptable to God? What would God expect of me? What would God demand of me? What, what is God looking for from me? Whatever the circumstance might be that I'm facing at the time. Now, of course, if we're going to have that uh, Godward attitude, then that's going to demand a deep-seated inner conviction, isn't it? How, how firm are we going to stand if we just sort of believe something to be the case. Well, yeah, it may be the case. We're not going to stand very firm for that, are we? we don't, we're not going to care one way or the other. But if we have that deep-seated inner conviction of something, then we're going to stand for it. And until we develop that, that kind of conviction, then we're not going to stand much for, for anything. So when you think back to that expression in, Revelation 2 in the latter part of verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, even if it cost you your life. What's going to cause one to be faithful even to the point of death? This Godward attitude. I'm going to do what pleases God regardless of what it costs me. It may cost me my life. It may cost me some pleasures of this life. It may cost me some financial means along the way, if, depending on some circumstances. But I'm going to have this Godward attitude because of my convictions, regardless of what it costs. That's the attitude we need to develop. And that's what he's calling upon these people to do. Then we add to godliness, brotherly kindness. And we've noted, made this observation several times before, but when you look at the last two expressions, brotherly kindness and charity, what's the difference in the two? One of them, and brotherly kindness literally is brotherly love. And so what you have here, and the difference in these last two expressions is the kind of love that we're to have for brethren and then we're to add to that the kind of love we're to have for everybody else, people of the world. And so there's a special love that we have for one another as brethren. You go back to the first letter that Peter wrote when he talked about seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So we become children of God, and, and one, of the, one of the things that is involved in our becoming children of God is a, is a love for others who are children of God. In John 13, Jesus instructed His disciples to love one another to what degree? As I have loved you, He says. Herein shall men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So that idea of love of the brethren. As a matter of fact, John states kind of the other side of the coin in that regard. 
He said, if you hate a brother, you're what? You're a murderer. You're a murderer. Now, would you, as a brother or sister in Christ, take a gun and take somebody else's life? Well, I know brethren who've done that. But John says, if we hate a brother, we're a murderer. It's a pretty serious charge, isn't it? What's murder going to get you under normal circumstances? Get your life in prison. What's murder going to get you spiritually? It's going to get you more than life in prison. It's going to get you an eternity in hell. That's how serious it is. Why do we consider it such a serious offense to give somebody life imprisonment for murder, for taking somebody's life? Why, why is that such a serious offense? Why is such a penalty? Well, they are considered a danger to society, and that's just something that our society considers a very grievous wrong. Well, from that we can begin to understand God's, and here's that Godward attitude again. God's attitude toward brethren ought to be our attitude toward, toward brethren. That's the love thing. If we hate them, God has made it plain how He feels about it. You say, well, you know, I don't necessarily hate my brethren, certain brother or sister. I don't necessarily hate them, but well, I'm not sure I love them either. Really? What other attitude can you possess if you don't love them? What other, what other attitude can you have other than hate? I'm not sure the Bible allows another one. And so we need to learn to love one another as our Lord loves us. But when we have developed that faith based on the Word of God, and we have built on that the moral courage to stand where God wants us to stand, we have constantly increased our knowledge of the will of God, what God really wants of us, and we have developed a degree of, of self-control that regardless of the circumstances, we, we, are, we have self pretty much under control. Now we've developed this ability to endure whatever comes our way. We have a Godward attitude. How difficult is it going to be for that person who has developed those characteristics of life to love his brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not going to be that difficult. Now, if some of these other things are a little on the weak side, maybe we aren't able to, to control self as we ought to. Maybe we don't have the knowledge of God's will that we ought to have. Maybe we don't have the courage, you know, all those things. And again, these things work together. But when we've developed those characteristics of life leading up to this, then it should not be that difficult for us to love one another as brethren. But then we add to that charity. Or another word for that is love. And as I stated earlier, that's a different love than we have for brethren. We're to love people of the world. We're not to love the ways of the people of the world. But we are to love people of the world. When does God's love for mankind cease? Doesn't, doesn't. God's love is unconditional. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. But God's love is unconditional. And that should be the nature of our love for mankind. We don't love the ways of people sometimes. If it's sinful, we sure don't. But that doesn't mean that we don't love them. Now, it's kind of difficult to distinguish between a person and what a person does. How 
haven't you heard it said? Maybe you've said it. <laughs> because of something that someone has done to you, I hate them for that. I hate them for that. Really? Do you hate them or do you hate what they did to you? You see, there's a difference. And while we may hate things that people do to us or against us, we are to love all men. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus made that abundantly clear. Love your enemies. Well, who's, who's further from you than your enemy? Who would be of such nature that you would, if you were going to hate anybody, who would you hate more than an enemy? I don't know of anybody you'd hate more than an enemy. But Jesus said you even love them. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Don't love their ways. Don't love what they may do. But we love that individual. That's the kind of love that he's talking about in this regard. And if you think back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when Paul was talking about love, he said in the closing verse of chapter 12, yet I show to you a more excellent way. And then in chapter 13, he shows that more excellent way. It's the way of love. How does love act? How does love react? What, what's the characteristic? How, how do you identify love? Well, he lists those characteristics. And in 1 Corinthians 13, the first three verses of that chapter, he basically says, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. For love Without love, you're nothing. And then he describes how love acts and reacts. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love doth not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own. Love is not easily provoked. And on and on he goes. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And as I've often suggested, take the word love out and put your name in there and see if that describes you. It may help us get a little better picture of where we actually stand in that regard. But that's one of the things that we have to add. Add love. As we noted in the outline, love will take a Jew and cause him to carry the gospel to a Gentile. Now, who better understands that than Peter? That was his basic mission, wasn't it? Who was it that took the gospel to Cornelius? I believe it was Peter, wasn't it? had to answer for it more than once to Jewish gatherings, but he had the moral courage to answer correctly, except on one occasion. Remember what the occasion was? When he didn't do so well. All right, recorded in the Galatian letter, I believe it's chapter 2. But you know, Peter wasn't the only one that whenever the Jews came to town, he backed away from the Gentiles, which he should not have done. But he wasn't by himself in that. Others were involved. But his is specifically recorded. And so there's where the courage comes in. So we add these things to our lives. What is love? What? what? If you were going to if you were going to sum it all up, and I've tried to sum it up here in the outline for us, seeking the very best or the highest good for the person or object loved. If you say you love someone, you're going to seek the best for them. You're not going to wish them any ill will at all. You're not going to have a get even attitude with them. You're not going to have the attitude if they've done something really tremendously wrong against you. You're not going to have the attitude 
I just wish they had something bad had happened to them. Maybe they'd understand a little. No, 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 no. That's not a Godward attitude. That's not what godliness is all about, wishing bad for somebody who's done bad to you. Love seeks their best interest, their highest good. Easy? No, not always. I was in Fulton, Mississippi. Never will forget it. There was a young man there who was one of our song leaders. Very outspoken, but very, very, very good young man. Any time I'd cover something like this, I could, I could see Bob's hand go up. And I knew what he was going to ask. Brother Sidney, how do you do that? <laughs> that was always his question. How do you do that? Well, it's not always easy to love people that have done something really drastically wrong against you. But what's Peter saying in this regard? Add to your faith love. Something we have to work at. Something that maybe we really are real short on at times. Yes, probably so. But if we're going to reach that level of divine nature that we desire, and ultimately that eternal reward, then there, here's something we here's something we're going to have to work on. Is something we're going to have to work on. That's, that's it. And one of the things that you'll notice, and it's about time for the bell, but, but the last little statement I put in the outline there, I think, hope it's in your outline, under, under love, is it's active, self-denying, universal, permanent forgiving. And I'm going to come back. I want to talk about those things in more in detail next week. But one of them is forgiving. And this ties in with what Jim just got through saying. When we consider ourselves and how much God has to forgive us, then it ought to make it a little easier for us to forgive someone who's done something against us. A good principle to apply in that regard. So we're just going to hold on right there. Lord willing, next Sunday we'll talk more about that.